Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gavin Sundwall. I'm the Minister Counselor for Public Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Canberra. Uh, it's my pleasure today to launch this program, uh, an important program on how democracies need to think about and be concerned about disinformation, particularly state-sponsored disinformation. And I think you're going to touch on today how we can make ourselves more resilient uh, against disinformation, uh, a topic, honestly, that couldn't be more timely. Uh, we're honored to have with us Bethany Allen Ibrahimian of Axios uh, and Vicky Shu of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Billy McCarthy Price, uh, former CEO of Global Vision, a nonprofit uh, that, that again is made, whose aim is to make the, the world a better place. And Billy, I believe you are named as one of the top 20 up and coming women in international affairs recently as well. Uh, thank you. So we're delighted to have you as our host. Uh, let me just end by saying that this, the value of this program is all views expressed are not those of the US government. Uh, they are the views of the participants themselves, but we here at the embassy are delighted to host this program. So without further ado, Billy, uh, if I could hand things over to you. And again, uh, my thanks to Bethany and to Vicky and to you and to everyone who's joining us this morning. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gavin. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us as part of the Diplomacy Delivered series hosted by the US Embassy in Canberra. To commence our event today, I'd like to formally acknowledge that today, wherever you are in Australia, we're meeting on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands and formally recognise Australia's First Peoples' continuing connection to country, kin and community. And I would like to share my enduring respect of elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any First Nations people who join us here today. Uh, as Gavin said, my name's Billy McCarthy Price and I'm really passionate about increasing opportunities for young people to engage in policy making, international relations and diplomacy. Uh, I was previously at the Department of Defence where I was a grad in 2015 and more recently the CEO of Global Voices, not Visions, which is an Australian youth led not for profit that provides opportunities for young Australians to get involved in international multilateral fora. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversations that we're having today and uh, continuing these on Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, but definitely not TikTok. <laughs> Moving on to some housekeeping, I wanted to confirm that today's event will be held under Chatham House rules. So while you're free to share the content of our discussions, please don't attribute any direct quotes to anyone in our virtual room today. And I also wanted to mention that we'll be recording this event so that we can share it with our broader network. Um, in terms of the Q&A portion of the event, we'll be using the Q&A function. Um, so if you'd like to submit a question, please go ahead and do so whenever you'd like during the event. Um, and if you'd like a specific speaker to answer one of these questions, just specify that in your question. Thanks to all those who have already submitted their questions when they registered for today's amazing event. Now that we're getting to the introduction for our speakers, I'd like to warmly welcome Bethany Allen Ebrahimian, who's the China reporter at Axios. Uh, before joining Axios, Bethany served as the lead reporter for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, China Cables Project, which was a major leak of classified Chinese government documents that revealed the inner workings of mass internment camps in Xinjiang. Previously, Bethany was an editor and contributing reporter at Foreign Policy magazine and a national security reporter at The Daily Beast. Bethany spent four years in China and is now based in Washington, DC. Our second speaker is Vicky Xu, who was previously a journalist for the New York Times Sydney Bureau, covering general news with a focus on China-Australia relations. She also covered China and Chinese diaspora communities for the ABC's Asia Pacific Newsroom in Melbourne. Vicky holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Melbourne and during an exchange semester in Jerusalem, researched One Belt, One Road, China, Iran and China, Turkey relations at the Harry S. Truman Research Institute. A big welcome to both of you today. Thank you for being here with us, um, especially with that time difference, Bethany. We really appreciate it. We hope that today's session will provide all of you, our participants, with an opportunity to hear a more nuanced exploration of the PRC's malign influence in the Indo-Pacific region from these expert panellists. 
um, I'm going to pass the virtual mic over to both of you now. Um, and to get us started, I just hope that you could provide just a brief outline of, of your engagement to date in this subject matter. And then I give you full permission to go free range for the next 40 minutes or so. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Billy. I think our discussion to today, we're going to talk about four main points. We're going to talk about disinformation and malign influence, how democracies respond to human rights abuses, how China uses tech to build a surveillance state, and COVID-19 and CCP engagement with that, uh, especially with the narrative um, around the world. And so, Vicky, why don't we get started? I'll pass it over to you. What does China do in terms of disinformation? And to get the ball rolling, uh, you know, there are many ways in which the Chinese state engage in misinformation, disinformation campaigns, and, uh, you know, and attempts to exert malign influence. But I will just throw out one example that's really made an impression on me and talk about uh, two main forms of, um, you know, so-called so -called influence uh, the Chinese state has overseas. So, you know, when we talk about Chinese influence with Chinese interference, and we often think about the actor as the Chinese state, the PRC state. Um, but that's not um, all that's happening. So from where I stand, sit uh, in Australia, we have a sizable uh, Chinese Australian community, which includes, you know, Chinese Australians, Malaysian, um, Chinese Australians, or, you know, Taiwanese Chinese Australians. And then you have the Uyghurs who are also, you know, at least formerly Chinese PRC citizens. And you have those more recent migrants coming from mainland China. And um, so, you know, when we talk about Chinese influence, there is this sort of state sanctioned, you know, cyber attacks or, um, the, uh, you know, Chinese state media propaganda, but there's also the part of influence where the Chinese state is, um, I frame this as um, trying to hijack a community of Chinese Australians and trying to get them to do the dirty work or trying to get them to spread misinformation. So one example of this is in 2017, I was um, reporting on this massive event when the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang was visiting Australia. And um, prior to this visit, there was a lot of concern from the PRC that, uh, you know, Tibetan or uh, Uyghur or Falun Gong practitioners, they would come up and protest. There would be pe Chinese petitioners who had their specific concerns they wanted to raise. They would want to, tr you know, try to use this opportunity of the state visit uh, and sabotage the state um, visit um, or, you know, sabotage that in you know, from the Chinese government's perspective. So what happened was uh, I was able to obtain a, a recording of a secret meeting inside of the Sydney Chinese consulate where you know it's a meeting of about 100, 120 Chinese community leaders and um, the Chinese consulate, Chinese consuls were giving them instructions on how they should organize um, a 6,000 people rally to drown out um, protesters. And how, you know, one very striking example was um, there, you know, in the recording you could hear there was a PowerPoint situation going on and there were pictures being displayed of, you know, from a previous state visit when um, patriotic Chinese nationalists were physically assaulting Falun Gong practitioners. And one consul said, you know, isn't this brave? I'm paraphrasing here, isn't this brave? I will be eternally grateful to these, you know, patriotic people who are, um, you know, defending the political, um, dignity of Chinese leaders. And then the room of 100 people applauded. So yeah. that was terrifying to hear. And it also says a lot about how this kind of influence is being um, exerted, right? It starts with you have, you know, completely innocent community organizations like a dance troupe or a ballet school or a calligraphy club or a chess club. And then 
And then, but the, the problem is the gatekeepers or the community leaders who hold power inside of these um, very innocent institutions, they listen to or they're co-opted by um, you know, Chinese officials. And then they gather in a room where they discuss things that are not any more innocent that could be considered, you know, malign. Um, and that and that is, you know, so when Chinese students are confused, like, why are we brought into this whole um, narrative of, you know, we're not agents, we're paying a fee to study in Australia? Why are we considered to be part of, you know, a malign campaign? And um, I think that's where that gap comes in. And that's where the a lot of like misunderstandings and miscommunications happen. Um, so just to wrap the point up, you know, we need to look at Chinese state interference and how they look to hijack um, the whole community to become a tool of influence. And both aspects are equally important. Um, it's amazing. I remember when that article came out and I remember being stunned by it and thinking how incredible the reporting was. And I totally did not know that you were the person who obtained that recording. Um, but I, I remember that because it's so rare. It's so rare to have that kind of proof. I mean, a recording. In, in my reporting, I have tried to um, you know, report on these very similar kinds of events that have happen happened in the US. Same deal, you have Xi Jinping coming to visit, you have Hu Jintao, um, other people. And you know, it, it was already known that Chinese students and other groups, as you mentioned, it could be um, professional associations or hometown associations or something. Um, that they would show up very consistently uh, and hold signs. Um, but by interviewing people, people who you know trusted me to, to you know speak with me about what was going on, I heard the same things. You know, we um, the the consulate contacted the president of our student group of our hometown association, whatever. Um, they paid us, or they organized us, or they you know, they organized the buses, they gave us lunch boxes and snacks and signs. And in some cases they were told, you know, your job is to hold the, the space, to take up the space so that Falun Gong or other people can't, you know, be there in front on, uh, when, you know, the person comes down the road. So it's, it's really, um, it's, it's obviously not just Australia, it's in the United States and it's really around the world. I, uh, um, the sort of the exact same thing in 2008 in the lead up to the Beijing Olympics there was a global campaign and it, I thought you know in my opinion it's pro probably maybe one of the most successful covert Chinese government influence campaigns of all time because during the lead up to the 2008 Olympics there were a lot of protests, uh, not just Tibetans, but a lot of Tibetans protesting the, you know, the Olympics happening in a country where there was um, you know, severe repression of many kinds of people, in, including Tibetans. And so there were planned protests all around the world in capital cities all around the world. But there were also, and this was widely reported at the time, there were counter protests in uh, California, in London, in um, uh, several other European countries, uh, at lot, many places. And there were these, you know, patriotic Chinese. Um, and it was reported at the time as, wow, look at this spontaneous show of support for, uh, you know, for, for the Chinese government, for the Chinese Communist Party. And it turns out, and this is a piece that I worked on with a, um, a co-author of mine a couple of years ago, that there was the same consular involvement in I mean, a dozen countries, and not just consular involvement. In fact, there was involvement by the Chinese intelligence agencies in, in California directing crowds on the ground in real time saying, go over there, there's some Tibetans over there. And so, you know, this uh, amazing reporting that you have done, I, I think it helps shed a light on something that's happening everywhere. And as you mentioned, it, it, it's so harmful to Chinese communities themselves who want to be able to express themselves across a whole spectrum of opinions. And it's fine to be patriotic, but that can't, that shouldn't be the only thing that's allowed to be, uh, to be, to be um, communicated. And it, it really distorts our national dis debate and our international debate about what Chinese people themselves want. And I, and I think, you know, demonstrations like this also show us that, you know, whatever, hap whatever that's happening in China, whatever that's happening in Xinjiang or Tibet, are not 
regional issues. So I think, you know, like a very common sort of misconception is these are Chinese issues and, you know, we should care more about Australia or we should care more about what's happening locally. So, well, that's just not no longer a case, you know, when we live in a globalized world. So when you think about China's, you know, one of our topics today is China's human rights abuses. So when you think about uh, what's going on in Xinjiang, what's going on in Tibet, like a couple of things, you know, like these demonstrations that we've just talked about, um, Tibetan Australians or uh, Uyghur Australians, they, while living in Australia, they don't have um, the same freedom of expression as all the other Australians. And because of the pressure and, and cost and intimidation coming from the Chinese state, and, you know, that is undemocratic. And, you know, the fact that um, you were right, like I wasn't able to write about um, this meeting or explain it, uh, you know, in 2017, because, you know, on previously as a Chinese national, I had so much fear, you know, I was very worried about the repercussions. You know, if I reported uh, about that meeting, there are a number of things could happen to me and my family and you don't want that. Um, so, you know, in, in a way this is affecting our democracy in a very immediate way. And um, just to sort of um, go out on the human rights point a little bit more, on, I have been spending a lot of time writing about uh, Uyghur forced labor. So, you know, we have a human rights crisis. I'm gonna very briefly explain it. Um, we have an ongoing human rights crisis in um, Western Xinjiang, in Western China, in the Xinjiang Uyghur region. Um, you know, where an estimated million Uyghurs are being detained in re-education camps. A lot of them are sent to, camp, uh, sent to prison and a lot of them are sh being shipped around, you know, in Xinjiang and also out of Xinjiang to coastal provinces in China. And they are being put into these factories where they're heavily surveilled and they work and they're being re-educated, you know, that is, learn, you know, forced to learn Mandarin and um, undergo these like patriotic educations. Um, and this is a problem because uh, in the earlier report I published this year, uh, we identified 83 global brands, including Nike, Adidas, Apple, Amazon, Google, and all of these well-known everyday brands that are, you know, potentially, they have Uyghur forced labor in their supply chains. Um, so when this is going on, you know, every single one of us we're, who are physically in Australia, we are also, you know, we're Australian citizens, residents, but we're also global consumers. And we buy things from these brands that are potentially benefiting from Uyghur forced labor. And that make us part of this human rights crisis. And that makes us potentially complicit. And as a person, you know, we need to understand that and find ways to address that. That's a really great overview. Uh, and Aspie's work on this has been really influential. Um, I mean, I, I actually did watch the John Oliver show a couple of weeks ago. He did the feature uh, on, on what's happening in Xinjiang and Aspie's logo up on the big screen. So, um, you know, really impressive work um, from you and from, and from Aspie. Um, well, I don't mean to flatter Yale, but um, Bethany did was the lead was the leading reporter on the China cables, which you know was definitive for Xinjiang reporting. I think this is turning into a on um, a uh, <laughs> pai ma pi, pai ma pi. Uh, yeah pai ma <laughs> session. But yeah, on um, you know I won't explain her work for her, but yeah, if you could talk to us about China cables and how that went about, that would also be just super amazing. Sure. Well, I think this also plays into our discussion of how democracies respond or should respond to human rights abuses. And with, with what's happening in Xinjiang, uh, it has been so difficult to get information out of there. What's been really incredible to see is how so many people around the world from different you know, sectors and walks of life have come together to each try to contribute some knowledge to do research or to, you know, some kind of not special knowledge to, you know, to help provide one more piece of the picture. It's really been an, an incredible effort by Uyghurs abroad and by researchers and by journalists uh, and by, um, you know, people like you to, to come together. And that's, that's how democracies 
should respond uh, you know, to a human rights abuse and abuses anywhere um, is, is by helping to shed light on them. And to connect that back to the conversation about malign influence, it, it's, one, it's clearly one of China's long-term projects is to damp, tamp down on the ability of democracies to do that. And we've seen that in so many different ways. Um, to talk about Tibet specifically, um, you know, I mentioned what happened in the run-up to the 2008 Beijing Olympics. There's um, the Dalai Lama. So, you know, China puts pressure on any institution or even country that hosts the Dalai Lama, which has made it more difficult for him to bring awareness to what's happening in Tibet. Um, the Chinese government has sought to punish news outlets for, for publishing uh, on what's happening in Xinjiang, Mega Rajagopalan, who was the BuzzFeed China bureau chief, was expelled. There's been lots of journalist expulsions, and these, you know, this, these are things that, that cost outlets money. Um, you know, they put uh, Bloomberg <laughs> is a notorious example. They Bloomberg actually killed a story about the wealth of China's top leaders, um, presumably because if they were blocked, they would lose money. And and money is a really key way that. China uses or access to China's markets uh, to prevent companies and universities and institutions from saying things and criticizing China's policies. Um, it, it takes a lot of courage, um, especially for people who have a, an ethnic Chinese background, who have a, a national origin in China to, to speak out on these issues. Um, and I think you're very right. It takes a lot of courage from, you know, anyone at all to be speaking out on these issues, because I think, you know, a few, a few years ago, it just seemed like if you are not, uh, you know, actively trying to anger or antagonize the Chinese state, if you're not actively trying to be a Xinjiang or Tibet person, you are fine. But uh, I think it's become very obvious that's no longer the case, right? So we have examples here where everyday businesses and citizens are being threatened or or just sort of like become collateral damage in um, the crossfires. You know, some examples would be China's sort of coercive diplomacy tactics. Like, you know, you have airlines who have to change um, on their website, how they call Taiwan or Hong Kong. Otherwise, they can't fly into China anymore. You would have, uh, you know, Australian uh, wine and beef export, barley. A bunch of things have been delayed at the Chinese ports because of, you know, you know, political differences. And you would have, you know, I remember very vividly one example of there was one um, Australian child, on um, who was trying, who, who, you know, did like some kind of like a painting. Uh, on a bowl for a, um, you know, a beef related exhibition. And um, they painted a Taiwanese flag or some symbol of Taiwan. Um, not, um, and um, the, the thing got painted over um, because, you know, the exhibition that the school couldn't afford, the local council couldn't afford to potentially piss off China on that. And, and you have students in the classrooms here, you know, on since, you know, what happened a couple of weeks ago with, um, just very briefly, UNSW, uh, the, Uni the University of New South Wales, uh, you know, po posted this tweet on uh, quoting Elaine Pearson, uh, the director of Human Rights Watch in Australia, on uh, commenting on Hong Kong. And just the, the fact that, that the university tweeted on her quotes, and it angered a lot of Chinese students, um, and there was a whole protest against that. And following that, oh, you know, we have been talking with a lot of Chinese students who are now concerned that the university is not in, you know, on their side when it comes to freedom of speech, that the universities are more scared of angering China and losing, you know, potentially losing revenue than protecting, you know, academic freedom. So you have all these things act together. Uh, you know, I've been accused of um, being like really simplistic on this, but I'm going to just um, double down. I'm just going to say it again. I think these are bullying. Like this is what you see in the schoolyard. This is, you know, a bigger nation bullying a smaller nation. This is a bigger power intimidating, threatening a smaller power. And when that happens and when it's happening global, 
worldwide, um, worldwide, what uh, democracies can do is um, two things, you know, coalition building and consensus building. So it took us a couple of years for, you know, in, in, in both in the States and in Australia for the progressive party, political party, and the more conservative political party to sort of like come to some kind of agreement on, on how we view China, right? So that's already happened. But at the same time, now what we need to do is some kind of coalition building when it comes to trade. When China is treating Australia um, on trade unfairly, what should other democracy do and how they could react? And what could we possibly do to make China less of a bully in our trade relationships? And um, and that needs to go on and that will take a lot of political uh, willpower and and we have been you know seeing like new, new institutions emerging like the international what is it called ipac international um shit. parliamentary association oh i didn't just do that i'm so sorry everyone please beat me um Interparliamentary Alliance on China, Alliance. which, I'm, uh, which I I'm an advisor to. I'm so sorry. Um, but yeah, you know, that's a really good start. You have a hundred co-chairs, you know, they're MPs from different various democracies. Um, and that's a really good starting point. And there needs to be a lot more work done on, you know, building these consensus and taking actual um, actions. Um, and just one last tiny point on that, you know, we have been talking a lot about what to do to react to um, Uyghur forced labor and human rights abuses over there. And companies are saying, well, even though they want to do something, they want to stand up to China, they want to take care of their Uyghur workers, there isn't much they can do because they can't afford to antagonize the Chinese government. So what the government and these, you know, coalitions I've been talking about can do is offer them the excuses, offer them the backup to, to be able to, you know, rely on governments and be and refer to government um, sanctions or um, or 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 um, or laws to say regulations to say look you know by by us law by australian law we're not allowed to do this and that and to engage in any kind of forced labor hence china sorry but if you want to work with us we have to you know stop doing forced labor and stuff like that yeah yeah i think i, I don't know if this is a, an actual strategy on the part of the chinese government but if it is it's brilliant that they have integrated you know, Uyghur forced labor throughout so many supply chains. And when everybody is complicit, nobody can fight back. Um, it's it's a, an enormous problem. Uh, and it's, it's, really, it's really difficult to know how to solve without just you know, telling, uh, without total decoupling as we're talking about in the US, just being like throwing up your hands and sort of making, making somehow all the US companies pull out of China. Um, on the topic of, you mentioned coalition building and the IPAC. Um, there's a professor in the US, I think he's at Princeton, um, named Rory True, T-R-E-U-X, I believe, maybe T-R-U-E-X, Rory. And he came up with an interesting idea. He wrote an article a few months ago saying that we need to do freedom of uh, speech operations. So like freedom of navigation operations or fawn ops through the South China Sea where the US or other um, countries will sail through what we, you know, what are considered under international law to be open waters, but which the Chinese government has claimed as its own, even though there's no framework that exists in international law to claim open seas as part of a country's sovereign territory. So the idea is to do a freedom of speech operation. So that is to say universities should, should purposefully hold events to talk about things that are um, the Chinese government considers to be red lines and that universities should do this in concert with one another. So the idea is if one university invites, for example, the Dalai Lama to give a talk, it's easy for China for the Chinese government to you know, crush them in various ways, to turn off the flow of students or kick out their scholars or something. But if a hundred do a Dalai Lama tour. Yeah, but if you do a hundred, if a hundred universities all invite the Dalai Lama within a period of, of a year, more than he could possibly go to in his uh, ripe old age, um, then what what can uh, what can this is this is Chatham House rules, right? Uh, what, what can the Chinese government do in that case? So when you know when we stand together, if there is a um, as people say, a united front of democracies um, standing together. That is a much better and, and again, de more democratic 
way to go about this that can help preserve the rights of, of many people involved, of companies and of vulnerable minorities and, and many groups. And that's that's a really good point. And that will, you know, just yesterday I received a message on um, Instagram actually from a university student who uh, who went to the same university as I did. Uh, she's a student from the PRC and she was telling me about how she feels torn at a time like this, you know, when there's some level of decoupling happening, when, you know, the US uh, or the West has a whole narrative about how, you know, about China and China has its own sort of defensive um, narrative. And she feels sort of like wrapped up and just torn between these two. And she, she, she made a really interesting point. She said, I want to learn more about the truth. I want to seek the truth, but I think I don't have the courage to, because it's too dangerous to go either way. So, you know, I want to learn more about dissent. I want to learn more about human rights abuses, but can I really afford to? That is the question. So that just means, you know, as, and, and I mind you, this, this student studies in Australia and she's paying something probably, I would say a whole degree, three years in Australia is going to cost about a million RMB um, Chinese currency. And um, so that's a very high price to pay to study. And do they deserve a better environment? Do they deserve a better atmosphere to, to, to learn? Do they deserve to have the support to be able to explore the truth? I would say yes. Um, so, you know, what universities and our civil societies should be able to um, you know, on, on the one hand, these Chinese students are offering us, you know, a lot of revenue on, you know, for Australia, international education is our third biggest um, export industry, and we're actively, you know, siphoning a lot of money in from that, and that is used to um, fund Australia's research. So when we are finding that revenue useful when these people are contributing to our um, economy, the least that the Australian society and um, universities can offer them is a better environment, is the tools and the um, protection that can be used to engage in freedom of expression. And that, that does not limit to criticisms of the Chinese government or other authoritarian governments, that goes beyond that. That extends to, you know, can they criticize Australian institutions? Will Australian institutions take those criticisms seriously? So, for example, you know, during COVID, we have Chinese students uh, accusing universities of, um, you know, uh, accusing the Australian society and a lot of Australians of being racist against them. And our universities didn't have the courage to admit that and didn't have the, the the will to rectify that that was massively disappointing and when that is happening how do you expect your students not to see you as being hypocritical and how do you expect your students to be able to to go like we accept this we accept the racism and now we'll go and criticize our home country that that emotionally that's just not going to happen yeah, so uh, that's as, dem as democratic institutions, yeah. we have a lot of, you know, reckoning to do with ourselves as well. Yeah. That's an incredible point. And um, I, I feel so sympathetic to you, that, that person who reached out to you. In the US, we have also really had insufficient discussion, although some discussion about how universities have been really eager to bring in many Chinese students, but have not provided them the support that they need. It's just normal kinds of support, you know, just when you have that large of a group of international students living on campus. That's one reason why, um, you know, Chinese student groups have been able to be so close to the consulate is, is because the consulates offer them legitimate help, they need help, you know? Um, and so that's really on us um, for not providing a better, a better environment. And of course in the US, you know, we have seen in, in recent months, um, you know, discussions and also measure after measure targeting, um, you know, Chinese students who are here doing STEM research. Um, there's, you know, Stephen Miller, a, an advisor to the president floated the idea of, of just canceling all student visas. There's 369,000 Chinese students in the US. Um, I, I think many, many students here do feel under siege and that's um, not helpful to anybody. And I think it's, it can be really um, tragic for, you know, for students who feel so displaced.
I think we, we're moving beyond our, 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 our stated topics, though. I, I see a question about how the US government can support these universities, media outlets, and other institutions who are facing pressure from CCP organs. I think that's an incredible question as well. So, you know, when we do reporting on things like Xinjiang um, and the Uyghurs, we rely heavily on outlets like the RFA, you know, who has an incredible, an incredible team of Uyghur reporters who are doing, you know, some of the, you know, a lot of international reporters rely on their leads and their reporting to, you know, and then we, we take that and we go and expand them and publish them. Um, so, you know, for organizations like the VOA and RFA, uh, that's the Voice of America and Radio Free Asia, on, well, first, first and foremost, funding is very important. It's important for, you know, all in the United States administrations to, you know, to, to, to commit to freedom of expression and to commit to the institutions that have already existed and to individuals who have made an incredible sacrifice already um, and to not let them down. And uh, for universities, and then again, it, the, the same goes for universities. They, this kind of works like, you know, how global companies have to rely on governments to come up with regulations and legislations they can refer to, to have any power to stand up to the Chinese state. So, you know, universities need um, Western governments, you know, Australian and US governments legislations and regulations to be able to say, look, we can't do this. We can't not host Dalai Lama because that will breach a certain rule in, you know, in our country. But, you know, right now, a lot of, um, a lot of these mechanisms and a lot of these legislations are missing. And when people are being threatened or intimidated, so for example, you know, if I, let's just say hypothetically, if I were personally being intimidated or my family members are being intimidated, I know who I can talk to, I can go to all these agencies and report it. But if it's another, you know, five years ago when I was a student, I would not be able to do that because I don't know anyone in these circles. And, you know, when I go out to the Uyghur communities, when on um, the Uyghurs, you know, who are truck drivers, who are teachers, who are nurses, they want to report this kind of harassment. They don't have anyone to turn to. If they go to the local police station, the police officers doesn't understand what's going on. Um, they don't have a line. So there needs to be mechanisms to be established for people and organizations to securely um, report. And there needs to be some kind of an office and institutions to handle um, these harassment and intimidation efforts and to basically gather enough information and reports, um, not in the, you know, this already exists with um, the intelligence agencies in various countries, but that's all classified. So we need some way to be able to um, gather these information, not in a classified way, and make them public and make this issue known and shed some light on this. And, but so far, it's all, you know, media reports here and there. There isn't a systematic way to deal with that. And that is something that we need to continuously think about as well. Those are all really good suggestions. Um, and something I would add to that would be that universities should convey to their students every year, I mean, there should really be awareness around this, that for that, well, any kind of intimidation is not allowed on campus and intimidation by a foreign government is not allowed on campus. Um, you know, one thing that um, people have said in the US, and you mentioned something, a, a very similar concept. The idea is that, you know, Chinese st students, wherever they are, um, are currently being very heavily incentivized by the Chinese government to act in a certain way or to not act in a certain way, right? But they're really not being heavily incentivized on the other side. They're not being given cover, right, to, to act in a different way. No one's pushing them really to be, um, you know, to, to, to do the opposite of that. No one's pushing them towards being more democratic or, you know, supporting freedom of speech or supporting the Uyghurs who might be at school with them. And to have, you know, um, you know, the, the, the university administrators say every year, you know, this kind of behavior is not acceptable. I think it could, it could give Chinese students cover 
to not act that way and to not feel peer pressure to act that way. And that could help diversify the, the, the opinions and activities that are viewed as acceptable. Um, shall, we, shall we address the topic of a surveillance state? Let's do that, yeah. Let's do that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, China cables and, and what we looked at there. So um, one of, we got um, a, you know, a set of, of classified Chinese government documents and four of those documents were they dealt with um, something called IJOP, the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. Now it's much easier for generally people in the world and particularly in the West to understand the concentration camps aspect of what's happening in Xinjiang. We understand concentration camps. You know, uh, we, we dealt with that in World War II in, in Germany. We know what that is. We have a little you know, folder in our brain to understand what that is. We don't understand what IJOP is. IJOP is a pre-crime platform, a, a crime prediction platform where it uses AI and mass data collection um, it's you know, put through some very complex algorithms to, to literally spit out names of people who are at risk of doing something the Chinese government doesn't like. The closest analogy I can think of is, is the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise um, from, I guess, the early 2000s or something. But in that movie, it's, it's psychics who are like floating in a bath of water who like their brains, you know, spit out these names of people who are gonna, gonna commit murder. But like, that's literally what IJOP is, except that it's not psychics, it's AI. So uh, our, we got four classified briefings that looked at the, the, how IJOP was being implemented, the back end of what was actually happening how it works is all this data is fed into it, basically as much data as the Chinese government can get their hands on. And it's really hit or miss. I mean, it's just kind of random, you know, whatever they can get goes in there, kind of a catch all, you know, garbage disposal of data. Um, and what comes out and is, you know, names of people and those names go to the phones of police officers in regions around Xinjiang and they'll get a notification. And in the documents, the term that was used was literally a push notification, except that it's for people, for human beings, right? So it'll go up on their phones. And um, so the police officers will go to that person's residence, interrogate them, put in more information from that interrogation into the IJOP app, which then goes back to IJOP, which is like a big, it's like a physical thing in a room in Beijing or something. Um, and then many times they were, they were taken and put in concentration camps. So it's arrest by algorithm, if you will. And I remember the, the, in all of those documents, the sentence or the little, the little paragraph that struck me the most, and, and I find quite haunting, actually it haunts me, is it went like this. In the period between June 14th and June 21st, 2017, IJOP pushed the names of 24,000 and some odd people. Uh, you know, after, after the public security bureaus went out, they were able to, um, you know, speak to 16,000 uh, and some odd people and put them into um, education and training, which is a, a euphemism for the concentration camps. The end. And I thought, a week. 16,000 people's lives were just ruined because of an app, because of an algorithm that spit out their name. And the rest of that, of that classified briefing, there were, there were six bullet points, you know, big paragraphs. And it wasn't like, hmm, I wonder if these people might not have actually done anything. It was, why didn't we get more of them? 24,000 names were put out. Why did we only get 16,000? You know, this, this is real. This is happening. This, and this was three years ago. You know, how much more advanced is it now? And I wonder how many of the million or two million people who've been, through the, been in the concentration camps, how many of them were put in there through a crime prediction platform like this? And it's hooked up to, you know, surveillance cameras. They're, they're working on a technology of being able to use, you know, to turn facial recognition cameras into data that can be fed into, you know, that system. Other data, you know, is your, from your electric meter, you know, from... Um, apps on people's phones that was fed into there, all kinds of stuff. And I, that's horrible anyway and terrifying, but what's even more terrifying and what I always tell people is that you need to pay attention to this because what's happening in Xinjiang is not staying in Xinjiang. It's already in other places in China. Uh, and, it's, and the Chinese government is actively exporting this through um, systems such as the so-called safe city technology that they're exporting around the world. This is something that the Chinese government feels they can make money on, that they can you know, sell. And 
they, they have better relations with authoritarian governments. They feel more secure when there's more authoritarian governments. They don't want other authoritarian governments to be, um, you know, to be felled by protest movements because it puts them at risk. So it's really in the CCP's best interest to allow authoritarian governments around the world to crack down on dissent. So they're exporting this. It's really terrifying. It is. Um, and also, you know, IJOP, as some people might, might, you might say, yes, that's so terrifying. And that's in China, but we're not living in China. And, you know, that's wrong because, uh, you know, these everyday, other everyday um, apps that I see uh, a question about TikTok up there. So these other everyday um, softwares that you use that originate from China, I think there's this like very, uh, I see a common sort of argument uh, coming from a lot of sort of like young people living in the West that say it is racist to discriminate against TikTok. What's not? Um, you know, the exclusion and the concerns about TikTok is not race-based or it's not about the Chinese nation as a ethnic nation. It's about the Chinese state as um, an authoritarian regime. So, you know, when we think about the, the, the consequences of the growth of TikTok, um, I wrote about um, the relationship between companies like Huawei, TikTok, WeChat, Alibaba, uh, with the Chinese government in the context of Xinjiang in a report um, ASPI published last year called Mapping More of China's Tech Giants. I think it's written probably exactly a year ago. So uh, there was a section called All Roads to Xinjiang where you know, I found all these links between you know, TikTok's parent dump company ByteDance um, their link to the Chinese government and how, you know, companies like Huawei or um, those Chinese telecommunications companies like um, China Unicom or um, how do you say Zhongguo Yidong, a um, um, bunch of them, um, how they aid, assist, and actively participate in the um, crackdowns against Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And because there are both um, political and economic incentives for them to do so, right? So in most of these big Chinese companies, there is a, um, there's a party committee, you know, there, there's a communist party branch. And these communist party branches, they want um, not exactly points, but like let, we can understand it as more merit points. So to get those merit points, that means they will send um, the cadres working at these companies to villages, to um, counties, to carry out um, you know human surveillance work for the Chinese state on the Uyghurs. You know they would go and watch and live with the Uyghurs. And other forms might be, you know, for example, bike dance, they would um, work with the uh, a local Xinjiang propaganda bureau and pump out all these police propaganda on the platform. So um, they're more than complicit in the ongoing human rights crisis. And the more powerful these companies become globally, the more they are able to work with the Chinese government, the more they're able to enrich, if you call it that, their programs in these um, regions where, you know, large scale op um, oppressions are happening. Um, so that is a, you know, a human rights concern to a large extent. But when it comes to private privacy concern, these companies by Chinese um, national intelligence law um, passed in 2017, they have to, they are obliged, they're obligated to hand over whatever data the Chinese state wants them to hand over. Um, so uh, that means, you know, when you have a company like ByteDance or Huawei, when they say they're not having any kind of cooperation or collaboration with the Chinese state, that is not true because they don't have the power to actually make that statement. And it's always going to be a concern. It's always going to be a problem on, you know, for people and organizations in democracies. Um, and as, you know, China West or China US sort of conflict ramps up, your data becomes even more valuable, even becomes even more likely to become intelligence in these conflicts. And that just gives 
you know, the individuals all the more reasons to not get on these apps or use these services to protect your own data and yeah, safety. I think I'll use that as a perfect segue into answering some of the questions that we've seen come through the chat and also some of the ones that were submitted as part of the registration process. Um, to start off with, I know that neither of you are Walter Mercado, but is it possible for you to provide a little bit more in terms of what you think the COVID-19 pandemic will mean for CCP engagement in the world in the next few years to come? And build on Callum Weir's question here, do you see the CCP's aggressive foreign policy being met with more resistance from democratic countries in the future or not? I think we're potentially gonna see two opposing results to opposite kinds of forces resulting from the coronavirus epidemic. And first is that uh, China's economy appears to be, according to World Bank projections and projections by other economists, the only major economy in the world that's projected to grow in 2020. So that means that its relative power to the United States and other countries is going to grow, uh, which means that you know, it, it will just have more power to do all the things that it wants. Um, on the other hand, um, I, don't, I do not think that the coronavirus has, on the whole, made China more popular around the world. I think pretty much everyone on the planet knows that it originated in China, despite the Chinese government's best disinformation efforts to deny that. Um, you know, this has been, when was the last time the world had this kind of event that literally froze us in place across the world? Uh, and that happened because you know China failed to contain it. So that's something that I, I, I think. So and most certainly, you know, in the U.S., there's been a pretty extreme reaction against just average Americans. I mean, polling in the U.S., China has been is viewed more negatively than in the entire history of Pew Research polling. Um, but it, it's really it's a complex picture too because you know the the only other country that really can challenge China is the U.S. and we. Um, have just massively, massively mismanaged our epidemic. And um, I, I think made democracy look bad in the process. Uh, so you're welcome. Um, so I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a scary world, it's a, it's a complicated world. I do think it's a world where more people have woken up to China's um, propaganda efforts and sort of the the insidiousness of it. I mean, Italy, for example, has, you know, had just massive debates about this. Um, Spain, uh, the Czech Republic, lots of places. Uh, and I think a lot of people now understand that, that China's just, it's, it's here. It's not coming, it's here. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good answer. I don't really have anything to add to that. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Alan, we submitted a question very early on, and I think it really um, builds on the conversations that you've had about trade and about protecting university students. But given the distinctions and overlaps between the Chinese government, the Chinese diaspora and Chinese Australians, what are some guidelines about how we can legitimately discuss CCP foreign interference without inadvertently provoking prejudice in the community against Chinese people? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, and it's a really complex one. So, you know, I started reporting on Chinese interference and influence, Milan influence um, in late 2016, early 2017. And, you know, I was brought into other people's projects um, at the beginning. And um, there was the sense, like back then, there was this sense like, is this really happening? Are these TV producers just being racist? Because you would have a newsroom where like no one really knows so much about China or Chinese culture and you would have a TV producer who come up to me and ask, hey, Vicky, can we just go out and film some like Chinese culture? Like I heard there are like people who sing red songs on like in the park or something like that. So when you her reporting on Chinese influence or interference efforts that are malign. And then when you mash that up with like cultural things of like, just like innocent Chinese people singing, that that is a really slippery slope um, to go down. So when we're doing this kind of 
work, you know, when we're discussing when, or when we're reporting on the line, you know, Chinese state influence, we have to be really careful and we have to be really professional and we have to be really accurate. And one good way to do that is increase diversity. So we currently, I think both in the United States and in Australia, we have a lack of media diversity. I am so often the only non-white reporter I see in the room. Um, so, you know, and I, I definitely try my best to bring in other, you know, linguists or people with different backgrounds. But I, to be honest, I think institutionally, we don't do that enough. And the same goes for, um, you know, government, uh, government departments, you know, you don't have enough Chinese linguists in the intelligence communities, you know, a few years ago, and you don't have enough, um, you know, Taiwanese Australians or Taiwanese Americans or Uyghur Americans that are like, you know, that exist in these offices. Um, so that sort of voices and presence of, you know, subject experts and people from diverse backgrounds will help us to engage in these conversations in a more accurate, in a, in, in, in a better, in a more nuanced way. So that's point one. The point two is um, we can't exactly, dif you know, disconnect the Chinese people or the Chinese diaspora community from the Chinese government simply because um, there has been decades of um, efforts, you know, from the United Front Department and from the Chinese government and media in general to co-opt to um, the, the diaspora populations. And it's come to a point where, you know, you would have a student who just feels patriotic because growing up in their life, they've never heard about 1989 Tiananmen Square crisis. They've never personally seen any tragedies. They've only seen a China that's been, you know, increasingly powerful and rich. And they, they, they go abroad, they experience some racism, and then they're like, China was better. So that's the whole, their whole world. And then they, you know, they get a get a message on WeChat and ask them to go to a pro-China rally, and they're like, "Why not?" And they go, but this was actually, you know, um, a rally organized by the Chinese consulate. So this is an example of where you see that you can't exactly separate the Chinese groups, um, people from the state, because where does it start? Where does it end? Um, and in that case, I think what the best we can do is to educate and to spread awareness to basically, you know, remind people of their humanities and remind people of their common grounds. So, you know, when you, as Bethany said, when we have a freedom of expression um, operation, when we bring Dalai Lama, uh, when we bring these human rights activists into our campuses and talk about their experiences, I think, um, you know, that's where you can inform, that's where you can educate and let your students and let your diaspora communities make up their own minds. Um, and, you know, in, at, at the end of the day, my personal belief is the truth will always prevail. And hopefully that is the case. I mean, I strongly echo all of those, all of those points. Um, and you know, feel that I, I, I'm not sure how much more I have to add, given that I'm not Chinese, um, and Vicky's the expert on that. But I, I would, I would add maybe a couple of things, um, which is that in the U.S., as you know, we have sought to to find out the ways that the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, is trying to influence our domestic politics. For example, uh, it's really important for people like you know, investigative reporters and researchers and others to remember that targets are very often not Chinese people at all. You know, it's, you know, it's corrupt like white dudes with, you know, companies and or donors or whatever. I mean, it's very frequently not the Chinese person in the room who's the problem. And racial pro profiling or assuming that someone might be a risk because they are Chinese or Chinese American, um, it's, it's bad and it's wrong and it's super harmful and, you know, it marginalizes people. And it also doesn't, it doesn't help solve the problem. Um, you know, that's because Chinese people aren't the problem. Like they're not inherently the problem. It's, you know, it's the forces that are being exerted by the Chinese Communist Party, which can be exerted on literally any person. Um, so, you know, it, it's actively harmful in, in so many different ways. Thank you both for your comments. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to put a stop to the Q&A because we're right on time. Um, though I know that we could definitely go well into lunch with their 
questions that we've been getting through. I apologise for anyone who submitted a question that didn't get answered. I'm sure that um, our panellists will be happy to continue the conversation, like I said, on other platforms um, if you really needed an answer to your question today. Um, I just want to ex thank you both for your time um, and for answering all the different questions that our participants threw at you and, and for sharing your perspectives on, on what's been going on. And I would like to extend our gratitude to all of you, our participants. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us and connect and engage in what was a really valuable discussion. Um, please keep your eye out for other diplomacy delivered events that are advancing on the horizon. Um, and we really look forward to welcoming you back soon. And take care out there, stay safe um, and have a lovely day.